has a master's degree in classical guitar performance from NEIU, and he has also studied Spanish flamenco guitar in Andalusia, Spain. He's visited over 30 countries to gather musical materials, perform, teach, and collaborate. He's taught guitar workshops all over the world and also founded the world music ensemble Las Guitarras de España. To the far right, Satya. Satya is a vocalist. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Satya is a vocalist, composer, lyricist, originally from Bombay, India, trained in South Indian classical music, and she's performed with world music, jazz, and experimental groups in Chicago and beyond. Her primary media of expression are music and photography, and her interests lie in exploring cultural intersections and urban themes. To the left, Satya, Patricia Ortega. <laughs> Patricia Ortega is a vocalist composer with a degree in music education from Northeastern Illinois University. She has Mexican-Cuban musical roots, and she's also the co-founder of Urban Flamenco Arts Project, a music and dance company in which the flamenco arts are utilized as a presentation tool for mentoring at-risk youth in Chicago. And finally, Saraswati Ranganathan, known as Sarah. <laughs> She's a master veena player, and we'll hear more about the veena, which is the instrument that she has in front of her throughout this lecture. She's also founded a school ensemble of ragas in Schaumburg, and does a number of collaborations with other musicians, including Las Guitarras de España. And uh, la, the ensembles of Ragas and Schomburg teaches Carnatic, classical vocal, and vena. So, let's give a warm applause to all of the musicians that are with us here today. So, the idea of this lecture is to have a panel discussion, but a discussion in which the musicians not just speak, but actually illustrate musically examples of the kinds of things that they are saying. And it specifically deals with a connection between flamenco music and the music of India and Pakistan. It's a bit of a controversial theory, but most people believe that on some level, flamenco originates 500 years ago, informed by Indian music, which has been brought to Spain by gypsies. So I want to ask first, Satya, because she's done a number of investigations on this. So um, how, did, how did that happen? Or wh what time period are we talking about those migrations? Just tell us a little bit more, at least about the theory of how that happened. Okay, first of all, I want to say that um, um, I'm not you know, professionally trained uh, ethnomusicologist or anything. I've just been exploring different uh, means of connections between cultures. And uh, ever since I've been working with the flamenco folks, um, I keep seeing these commonalities. And I feel like, why did this happen? Where is this coming from? And uh, one of the fundamental, uh, in the theories of the origin of the flamenco music, one of the influences has been that of the gypsies who were apparently originated in the India-Pakistan region, the northwestern region of India, around the 10th century. They, there was a, a wave of migration out of that western, uh, northwestern part of uh, India-Pakistan uh, due to invasions from Muslim invaders who came from uh, Iran and further beyond. And so there were the locals who fought the uh, invaders, and because they got defeated, some of them left the country and started migrating towards uh, towards the Northwest, through the Khyber Pass, through Afghanistan, Persia, Turkey, and so on through Central Asia. And then eventually they reached uh, Andalusia, the south of Spain, uh, in the, around the 1400s. So 1425, uh, I think, was the first time they, people had uh, noted the arrival of the gypsies in Andalusia. Wow, so at that point in time, then, this music begins to be formed. And to musicians who then experience it, now flamenco and as well as Indian musicians who are experiencing it, certain parallels, certain nuances, certain kinds of features start to strike the musicians as common or you know, maybe like long-lost cousins from distant ancestors 
So t tell us, uh, I don't know, Satya or Carlo, tell us a little bit more about that kind of, uh, those kinds of connections that you experienced as musicians that all of a sudden you're like, wow, that, that is uh, familiar. Okay, so um, I could just give you a you know, story that relates to me playing music in Rajasthan. I was in Udipur and I had my guitar and I was just walking around and sure enough, some people spotted me and they said, well, you must come and we must have some sort of a get together, some sort of a performance. And um, I would say that they, these would be folk, folk musicians. Uh, you know, th these, these were guys on the street hanging out and playing. And um, we were, you know, we were encouraged to come and, and perform with them. And uh, it took them all of about 30 seconds to pick up on the flamenco rhythms. So I thought, hmm, this is something interesting. You know, we, we don't know about all these connections, but here is just like one person playing this, this style of music and, and other people interpreting it and immediately like feeling the groove, feeling the accents. And I thought, okay, well, I don't, I'm not a scientist, but you know, here I am doing this. And, and to me, I'm, I'm sure there you know, are thousands and thousands of instances where this sort of thing happens, where people get together and they find commonalities. And so you know, in terms of actual proof, and in terms of the historical nature, yes, I've, I've done some re research and I've, and I've studied this too. But you know, until you're actually on the ground, I think, and see that there might be a connection between people from a certain region and music that you're playing, you know, when you see it in action, it's kind of like, oh, well, that is something to think about. So was it like in the rhythms? Can you give us some examples of some things that, yeah, that, I, that, that, were, uh, that struck you? Yeah, I might have been doing, um, I might have been doing something like this way. but with um, certain accents that, you know, kind of shift a little bit. And what I noticed is within, you know, just like I said, within a matter of minutes, we were all on the same page, like kind of grooving with that. And they were fine with it. And of course, they took it to some other place. And I was like, whoa, where are these guys going, you know? So, but, but the, the idea of just getting together with, in, an, in a very organic sort of a way and making that happen uh, became inspirational for me in terms of going back and when working on some things with Satya, and so, uh, you know, like if, if somebody says, well, is there absolute DNA proof? No, of course not, that, that there are connections to this music. But like when you actually see it happen, you feel like, oh, well, this is possible. I mean, so it's just one musician's experience. Yeah. And then at that point, did uh, you start to collaborate or sh somewhat sh thereafter, you started to sort of seek out those collaborations directly with uh, Chicago musicians, um, including uh, Saraswati. And what kinds of things did you discover in terms of like, were there rhythmic and uh, maybe uh, rhythmic cycles as well as melodic cycles that fit in together that you started to explore? Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about that, Satya? Uh, we can begin like with some of the scales we did with Walking yeah. Prana and Sarah could maybe jump in on some of that Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Um, I just want to say before we begin that um, when we started, when I started hearing flamenco music, the thing that struck me the most was the use of minor scales. And uh, in a lot of South Indian and North Indian music, I'm personally trained in South Indian music, which, is, which has some similarities with North Indian music, but uh, it's a little different too. But I, I really connect with the minor side of things. Um, so when I hear Carlo play these chords and he, he plays these uh, very typical flamenco melodies, uh, there are certain sounds in it which really grab me, you know, and there are specific ragas in Indian, in South Indian classical music which directly fit into the way the melodies go. Uh, even when I hear Patti sing, I mean, I hear these things in my head which are com maybe completely unrelated, but somehow they match. So in, there are handouts that we have given you, and we have mentioned certain ragas and that which T kind tell of... Tell us a little bit about what is a raga, because that may 
be unfamiliar to a lot of us. Okay, uh, raga. So, so raga is like, it's one of the fundamental units of construction of North Indian as well as South Indian classical musics. So um, a raga could at the very core be called a scale. So a, a scale can be formed out of seven notes, six notes or five notes going up and down. Now, um, it, it's like, um, if I give you an, an, an analogy could be that I, there are seven notes which have different colors. So I, if you have a paint box that has seven colors in it, so the paint box would be a raga, okay? And then you take your brush and then you start painting, say, a portrait. That would be a composition, so that would be a song. But if you just took the paint and, you know, did whatever you want with it on the canvas, that would be like an abstract rendering, so it would be... If you might have gone to an Indian concert, you might have heard uh, they improvise, the musicians improvise. Uh, you, you, you'll hear Saraswati do that too. So that's like an impressionistic expression, I guess, of the form of a raga. So an, a raga could also denote a mood. So it could be blue, it could be minor, minor sounding, like what we will demonstrate. And there are other, other ones which are major sounding. But uh, I think one of the first ones that we worked on was a piece called Walking Prana. Um, which featured three ragas. The first one was a minor morning sounding kind of you know, melody, you know, so um, so when Carlo plays that, to me that is like, you know, I'm waking up in the morning, uh, the birds are, you know, coming out, uh, the sun is coming up, and when I hear that, Saririka Padarapa Sadapada What I did was, is I, I thought, well, we have the flamenco uh, 12 count, but we put, uh, you can even, I think I wrote this one on the handout, that basically we have a, a cycle of three, three, and four. So I'm playing one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one. So three, three, four, to me, uh, which equals 10, was, uh, it became this 10 count kind of groove, which I actually later on used with Sarah on, on, on the Reverie piece, we used that in the middle. So um, using the, um, the scale that Satya just mentioned, this morning sound, right? Um, Indian music doesn't have a lot of harmony in it. And what I mean by harmony is what I'm doing on the guitar when I play. So I'm giving it, not only am I getting, giving it a certain groove, I'm also coloring yeah. the notes, okay? And in Indian music, that was one thing when I, when I did my little research and jam session over there, even when they played the harmonium, for instance, they weren't necessarily playing chords on the harmonium. Sometimes you get a chord, but for the most part, they were mimicking what the melody line was. So you have a lot of that in Indian music. Even when the Veena plays, right, you're mimicking the melody line, not necessarily yet. You're not playing chords much. So I think... The, the kind of the cool thing about our collaboration has been that the guitar provides something that, that you guys don't always associate with Indian music. Absolutely, even the thought process of moving from a minor to a major, the way you move harmonically, that doesn't really happen in Indian music. It's purely melodic movement. So play us a little bit more of a walking prana, another raga, or... progress into um, the afternoon raga, which yeah. uh, my chord sound.
So that's like a pentatonic scale for me. So when he plays that, it's like five notes. And we progressed into something called the evening, which is a little bit different scale. This one was. Um, uh, yes. Right, so when I hear that, that's the raga in this mode, in this scale, uh, is something which is very evening oriented in Indian classical music. Of the Dorian mode in jazz. So, what we do is we find that uh, some of the modes in, uh, if you're familiar with like the modes in music, like the, the, the basic scales of in jazz or in the Greek modes as they're called, um, Phrygian, and uh, we're, we're using Phrygian and Dorian in this particular piece. So, we're able to find the connections between the scales, the Indian scales, and they're on your sheet. It's the, some of the terms are pretty elaborate, so I'm not going to pronounce all of those for you. You can check it out. But basically, uh, we, we strung those things together to produce a piece called Walking Prana with a morning raga, uh, an afternoon raga, and an evening raga. So that kind of became the foundation for a nice piece of music that uh, you could hear in its full form on uh, one of our CDs. <laughs> you can sample it on iTunes, too. You don't have to buy it. You can check it out. Great. So then, so there's been this collaboration then with these melodic cycles. And, and how many ragas are there? Are there... So that's a difficult question. Uh -huh. <laughs> there are, it, it, technically, there are seven nodes, right? And there are variations of seven nodes. So as many permutations and combinations you can get from using all the seven nodes. In South Indian classical, there are 72 fundamental uh, permutations wow. and combinations. from. Wow. But then there are all these other derivatives. And it, they denote mood. So if you feel like something, you might sing a particular raga. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Sarah, tell us a little bit about ragas, a little bit more. And also, uh, before we, because I think the next piece will feature the veena, um, tell us a little bit about the instrument of the veena. And one thing I'm curious about is, uh, does it have a, it's a stringed instrument, does it have a relationship to the flamenco guitar at all? I'm wondering. No, <laughs> somebody's shaking their head. But tell, tell us a little bit more about ragas and also about the veena. Okay, I'll start with the veena, maybe, since Sati already covered some of the ragas. Um, the veena, um, I mean, here's a disclaimer, I'm not a historian, but the veena is supposed to have been in existence from times immemorial, so it's supposed to be a timeless instrument. Uh, this particular type of veena is called the Saraswati veena. This is held by, this is supposed to be played by the goddess of learning, who is uh, worshipped and revered in South Indian as well as North Indian tradition. And, um, the veena is supposed to, um, there are a couple of things that here that are very, um, we close, I mean, we hold the veena very dear and we worship the veena as well during certain festivals. And the other thing that we do with the sound of the veena is we are supposed to play it f uh, when, an, when a lady is carrying a baby because it's supposed to soothe and calm the nerves of the baby. And this is also used uh, in yoga music. And the other thing it's used for is, um, I forget, yeah. Just, just when the couple is getting married, they are supposed to hear the sound of the veena. So it has, some, uh, it has several such significances, like the sound of the veena is supposed to soothe and calm, calm your nerve. It's meditative, and it could also, um, it's both meditative and you can also hear some exciting music from the veena. It's actually a very versatile instrument. As far as its similarity with the guitar, 
it's similar and yet very different. They're both acoustic, they resonate off of a gourd. Um, I have frets, they are made of, this is made of beeswax and they don't have anything on them, it's just metal frets. But the main difference is I am able to do a lot of what we call gummacums, which is nothing but a lot of, which is bending on a single note. So, like they say, our music is not actually on the notes, our music is in between notes. The microtones, right? So, yes, they are the microtones. That's what characterizes the veena. That's, that's very special about the veena. I can demonstrate a little bit of that. And what else did you ask me? Um, no, that was, that was pretty much it. Do you want me to? I can just demonstrate a little bit. That'd be great. So, um, are we going to hear a little bit of a collaboration, uh, yeah, think, collaborative piece? I think the, um, one of the that Let me ask you to grab the mic, mm -hmm. just because I'm not sure people in the back can hear. Oh, okay. uh, Do you want to talk a little bit about Chitty Babu and how we came to that collaborative piece? Sure. Okay. So here's, we'll, I'll let Sarah set this one up. This is her. Um, there was this musician a great Veena artist from India, his name is Chitti Babu. He's, um, he's not alive, but he, in the 70s, his, his mission, his life mission was the Veena. He thought if the goddess of learning is supposed to be holding this Veena, then there, this instrument has to be versatile. And so he set out discovering the potential of the Veena, the versatility of the Veena, and he composed a lot of pieces. And one of them is the reverie, which actually has some parallels with the guitar because we use both strings at the same time. We'll demonstrate that to you shortly. So, uh, well, to talk a little bit about Carlo and I working together, uh, it's been a very enriching experience for me. We, they, we go back about six to seven years, I would think. And um, uh, Catalina asked me the other day, I mean, what happens when you and Carla get together. I think, uh, in a nutshell, I can say music happens, and Carla and I get together. So uh, it's like, although we belong to, I mean, although we represent different genres of music, when we get together and jam, uh, we just play. We just play because our, although our music has a variety of texture and it's diverse. Uh, there is that spirit of, uh, shared spirit of um, purpose. We want to share this positive energy, not only among ourselves, but also with wonderful art lovers like you and share that positive vibration. So you, you can carry some of those beautiful memories back home. So just as much as we do. So in a sense that we create a joyful space in this cosmos by doing this collaboration. So uh, we just want to demonstrate this piece, Reverie. You will see how it's similar and yet different. Uh, there would be a flamenco piece in between, but uh, yet when we play together, it would sound very similar, like one music.
That's beautiful. That's very, very beautiful. Um, I was, I thought it was interesting when the uh, percussive hand clapping, the palmas started. I wonder if, I know that Indian music and a lot of Indian dance has a percussive element. Do, have you found any similarities in that? Absolutely. Um, I want to point out in this piece, the cycle that was going on was 10. It was a 10 count cycle, right? So uh, Patty was, you know, doing the palmas in a 10 count, mm -hmm. um, right? And in the Indian classical too, you will see a lot of 10 counts. And in the handout, I have an example that the, there's a count which actually has a name. It's, and the way I would count it in, if I used that scheme would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And the way you would do it would be Yeah, yeah. So that's, th this is one. And then, for example, if you go to the Buleria, there is a 12 count, which we will demonstrate. We do a solea later, and then we'll demonstrate that to you too. So 6, 10, 12, eight, you know, 8, 4, 3, these counts, these cycles are all very similar um, mm -hmm. at, at the foundation. And then the hand clapping itself. So when, if you see an uh, Indian classical concert, you will see that the person who's singing will actually be keeping time like this with their hand. So that'll be eight, one, two. So uh, while they're singing, they'll do that. Um, and then going to, for example, if you have seen a Kawali musician, these are Sufi musicians from uh, Pakistan area, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, with Iranian influences. Uh, you might have heard the name Rumi. Um, all these came together to form the Kawali music in the northwest of India. And if you may have seen a group of Kawali musicians, you'll see some people, clapping, like loudly clapping, keeping time, you know? Huh, huh. What about, is there anything, um, I know that there's some, there's castanets in Spain. Right. Is there any, and then there's something, not, not castanets, but there's something similar, like that's used in percussive. There's like hand percussion that oh. uh, you, um, Carlo had mentioned going to a place called Rajasthan earlier. This is the Northwest region of India from where mm. the gypsies mm. actually were supposed to have left. 
And if you go there and you see some of the folk musicians, you will see dancers, dancing girls, who have little bells on their fingertips. Uh -huh. And they keep time while they are dancing. Uh, and then there is, there's something similar to a castanet. It is, it's also made of wood. So you'll see people keeping time like that with their, with their hands. Wow. And that was definitely something that struck me when I saw flamenco dancers and musicians. Wow. Also, you mentioned the Kawali. Um, the Kawali tradition, it's very spiritual. It's very right. inspired in its devotional music, right? Yeah. And so I'm going to let Patti tell us a little bit about Duende, because in, in flamenco, there's something called Duende, which reminds me a little bit of that kind of... Uh, maybe, um, spiritual or mystical connection? Sure, that's the age-old question, you know, duende. But I think all music has duende. Um, and that's something that I learned um, from the very first, I think, t uh, time I had a lesson with, with a cantaor. You know, and, and you mentioned before the microtones. And I think, my, you know, being born here, mm -hmm. I'm used to hearing, you know, my, my ears are very Western, so I'm used to hearing major scales, not minor scales. So it took my ear a long time to kind of get used to that. And I think that the Indian music really helped with that too, you know. And so uh, when I had this lesson with this cantora, I said, you know, I, I don't think I can get my voice to do all, all that, you know, the bending, you know, the, the ornaments and the melismas, you know, I don't think I can do that. But um, you can find duende in, in, in any kind of music that is, uh, that moves you, that has passion, that comes from the heart and soul, you know, you could see, you know, um, Freddie King guitar, Steve Ray Vaughan, you know, there's, there's, there's that, that something, you know, that comes out from them. And, and I think that in terms of flamenco, it's like, you, you know, you come and you just, you know, you leave your insides, you give it all, you give everything, you know, and you can't just, you know, whether you're sick, you have a cold, it's like, that doesn't matter, you come and you, you give it, you give it your all, always, you know, and I think, I think that teaches me a lot about pushing that in other forms too, is just always, you know, bringing that um, to whatever genre, whatever um, form I'm doing. Uh -huh. Well, sure. sure. But le let me give you the mic. Thanks. The spiritual element. Yeah, the spiritual, I think that's, I think that's the goal of all music forms, like Patty mentioned. It's, um, a simple example would be when you experience, uh, I don't know, in my uh, own personal life, I've experienced my mom singing, and then she just sponta spontaneously does her prayer. She sings. And uh, when I have, as a child, when I have listened to that, I have had a couple tears roll down my eyes. It's, so what it is is it's, it's when an artist is performing, it's not, it's not the music separate or the instrument or the person that's performing or the audience. So everything, um, the goal of the art is for the music, the artist, the instrument, and the audience, the, all, the differenti all the differentiation between all of that uh, ceases. And what, what is left is just the pure melody, the pure joy of the music that comes out of the artist. So as you go home, when you're humming a melody, from the artist, that means the artist have achieved, has achieved that purpose. <laughs> so the means. artist shared their duende. <laughs> and um, I'd like to add also... Sharing the um, positive energy. Right. Yeah. So one thing that struck me was when I was start reading about flamenco and duende was uh, Garcia Lorca. Um, I came across a lecture that he had given in 1933, Theory and Play of the Duende, and I want to read out one sentence that struck me. Um, the arrival of the duende presupposes a radical change to all the old kinds of form, brings totally unknown and fresh sensations, miraculous, generating an almost religious enthusiasm. Um, and in all the songs of southern Spain, the appearance of the duende is followed by a sincere cries of Viva Dios, deep human tender cries of communication with God through the five senses, thanks to the duende that shakes the voice and body of the dancer, a real poetic escape from the world. Um, in Carnatic music, uh, music, there is a composer called Tyagaraja, one of the greatest uh, composers. And he has a very, he is, this is exactly what he talks about. Like, without, you know, having a knowledge of music, uh, without devotion, without that authenticity, without a pure intent, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just sounds. And he has written lyrics on these lines, saying that you, and that's what to me Duende is too. It's like, it's the soul, right? Like without that, what it's just noises that you're making. So, 
And interesting though, also in, in addition to the spirit of Duende, the, it, there are some similarities, I think, but correct me or, or add, isn't there um, the, the beginning of the cante, the ay ay ay, yeah. de definitely calls to mind some other things. Absolutely, I think we'll demonstrate that mm -hmm. too. Um, like in the beginning of a concert, in any any Carnatic or uh, Hindustani, North Indian, South Indian, you'll see that the the singer will improvise a little bit and just set a bass for the concert. So they, it'll be like a, you know, a, you know, long tones, and then they'll improvise from that. And then when I see uh, the flamenco singers do that too, you start off with the ayes. And then, then you take off with the lyric. Then you introduce the lyric. So. Yeah, it seems like um, when I think of all the things you guys have just been speaking of, it reminds me of the piece that you guys worked on, the Invierno piece, yeah. because it, it's a combination of all those things. And it's, to me, it's the piece that has the most duende on our latest record. Um, when is I that the one it. we're going is, is yeah, to... Gonna, we're going to demonstrate a little bit of it, I think, if you guys are ready to do that. I'll give you the tones. But um, yeah, this is a piece that, to me, uh, you know... Um, symbolizes a lot of what you guys have just been speaking of. And it's called winter, right? Invierno? Yes, yeah, so it was uh, written um, the blizzard of last last year, that blizzard that we had. Uh, it was written and composed then. And um, so the way um, we kind of composed this together, created this this arrangement was, uh, it was a little bit of a play on the the salida, the quejillo, the, the temple, the ayes, whatever. There's so many different terms for them. Um, so we kind of um, jazzed it up a little bit. Um, we, we like to mix different things in together, so that's kind of how this uh, came to be. I should, I should point out that on the, on the, the final track, there's an amazing cellist from Syria, mm -hmm. Kinan Abu Afach, that kind of weaves in yeah. between their voices, which it's really beautiful. If you guys get a chance to experience it, you should hear this piece. Anyway, we'll, we'll demonstrate a little bit of it right now. Great. <clears throat> so this is in, uh, Invierno. Thank you. And so when I hear that, that's like a traditional, it's one of the foundation ragas of South Indian classical music. It's called Todi. It's like the Phrygian scale. Uh, it's not, and so when I hear that, I'm like, whoa, you know, what, this is coming out of me. She's singing this and, you know, this is, so that's what happens. Now we've been throwing uh, some words around, um, um, buleria, solea. So just to, to clarify that, which comes straight, totally out of the flamenco world. Patti, what, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about bulería, solea? Um, and I think this last one was a solea, ¿cierto? Solea por bulería. Solea por bulería. Tell us a, tell us a little bit more about that. All this different that. terminology, they, it's, in flamenco they're called the, the palos, which means stick, literally, but I think in this sense it's, it's like a suit of cards, and it's kind of a way that it, you know, we categorize all the different forms in flamenco. And they're categorized in different ways, um, uh, rhythmically, uh, through th uh, modes, um, regions, um, and also by the cantes. You know, there's um, 
there's, there, there's like this famous tree of flamenco and you know a lot of people that have studied have seen this but people have classified it rhythmically which I think is kind of an easy way of doing it in terms of twelves uh, threes uh, rhythms of th twelve three or four um, but uh, there's three uh, f uh, categories in terms of the cante uh, which is the cante chico which is um, little, 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 little chiquito. <laughs> and I think, you know, um, from my own personal experience starting out, that's kind of the forms that you gravitate towards. And I think children also, you know, you see a lot of uh, kids singing, you know, uh, the different forms like tangos, flamenco tangos, which is in four, uh, buleria, which is a very festive. All of these are party forms. So it's like you have to have your bag of you know, party forms, you know, because everybody can participate and, and it's very light and happy and festive. And then you have the, the intermedio, which is um, a tientos. Um, and it can, there's a couple that can kind of go in between. And then um, the, the mother flamenco, the cante hondo, the solea, siguiria, uh, cante al palo seco, which is just um, kind of what we were doing right now. We were doing uh, without any instrumentation. Um, which we will do later. Um, but so we can give a little example of, of um, Cante Chico, um, a tango? Yes. A little bit of tangos. So you can maybe move a little bit in your seat. <laughs> Flamenco tangos is um, in four, it's a, and so it's a kind of an easier uh, f uh, feel in flamenco to pick up right away um, when you're when you're first learning. So the palmas: one, two, three, four; one, two, three, four; one, two. Three, Fiesta, you know, kind of a party form, and. Sorry about that. It's worth addressing because uh, when you're talking about tangos, which is a party form in four, most people get their first kind of taste of flamenco music, or a lot of people have by 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 listening to the Gypsy Kings, right, or or something that's a little bit more commercial sounding. And uh, I have something written on there called the Rumba Catalan. It's on your sheet there. And uh, the reason it's interesting, and because it's a four count and it's a festive form, is that really the, it comes from the habanero rhythm, which comes from Cuba. And so we're talking about connections and, and all this stuff. Well, that was a major connection. It's one of the ida y vuelta forms, you know, in flamenco. So, so the, a lot of the, uh, the, the harmonies and music from Spain made its way to the New World. And then when sailors would, would maybe in Cuba be dancing habanera or they would take this back to Spain. And that's exactly what happened with the rumba catalan. And so it, it took many years to develop, but you get this uh, style that happens actually in the 1930s in Barcelona where they pick up this kind of a group. So that, that kind of becomes one of the, the festive forms. And yeah, the, the, the traditional flamencos, they, they all know how to play this rumba. It might not be the first thing you would see in a traditional flamenco concert, but this is definitely part of the family. And the, if the origins are, are 
pretty clear that we, it comes from the habanero rhythm from Cuba, so it's an ida vuelta form. So it's one of those things that uh, when we get to collaborating, even with Sarah or with Satya, um, the three, three, and four rhythm, for instance, that I was playing with Sarah, the four, the last four, is the habanero rhythm that I threw in there. So I was basically throwing in a rumba catalan into a collaboration with the Indian music. And uh, it's nothing too outrageous, but it's just something to note as long as we're talking about all these things. Wow. So f um, from India to Spain, and then um, Cuba, <laughs> and then back. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I know that you have one full piece, complete piece for us to, to close, but before that, maybe there's, if there's any questions from the audience, this maybe might be a good moment to get, um, get any questions. We have a mic, if you can yell really loud, that'll work too, but um, if not, there's a mic that we can, we can pass to you. Any, any burning questions or pressing questions about flamenco and India, Spain and India? You know, I wanted to mention something interesting. Like mm -hmm. when I when I used to read about flamenco, the gypsies and things. Um, uh, Patti mentioned uh, cante chico, the cante hondo, which is the cante grande. They it, that is the place where the gypsy influence was supposed to be the deepest, right? Like the cante hondo supposedly was where. Mm -hmm. The one interesting th thing that I saw was the word Iberian Kale. So the gypsies in Spain have the name Iberian Kale, uh, C-A-L-E, mm -hmm. but actually the word Kale in Hindi means black, it means hmm. dark. Hmm. So we have this, you know, connotation of dark-skinned people, hmm. Hmm. and that was like the first thing that struck me, whoa, like Kale, yeah, that's like dark-skinned Indians, right? Huh. Uh. Huh. And w when you, when we speak of Iberian Kale, what does that refer to? They're the people, the people, the people. who, the gypsies actually, who uh, that's wow. their, that's how they call them. So the Romani gypsies, that's how they call themselves. Interesting, so, interesting. Yeah. So there's like the language is showing you too that there's a connection. Ab absolutely. There's like all these words from, you know, in from the 10th, 11th century, from the mixture of languages in the northwest of India, you know, Hindi, Urdu, Persian, Arabic. You will see some of those words in the Romani gypsy language. Wow. So you had a question, yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for bringing up that point. That's a beautiful movie. Um, and, you know, really, the, and like you mentioned, right at the end, uh, La Pajare, Pajaro Negro, the mm -hmm. black bird, I mm -hmm. think that's what the singer sings in the end. And, oh my God, we talked about Duende. That was one place where I couldn't stop. Like, the tears just came out when I saw her sing. It's amazing. So, um, so Carlo, you want to add uh, some? No, I was going to, I just, there was one more thing I wanted to get to before we, I know we have some questions, and then we mm -hmm. have a final thing we want to play. There's one other thing I wanted to, to bring up, but is, is there enough time? Sure, That's sure. It. Okay. Um, the, uh, this is part of my background is Spanish classical music, and uh, an interesting uh, thing, and I, I put a little bit on that on the sheet. That's what's reminding me, um, is that Sati and I were able to collaborate on something that involved uh, a Spanish classical composer, and for some of you who might be familiar with some of the things that we do, I like to incorporate some of the composers like El Benes and Tarragon, people like that, who are Spanish composers and who were, at the time, 
uh, we're talking about now uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, flamenco was huge and, and you know, going through, it's, it's real, it's heyday in, in Madrid and places like that. And these composers were looking for materials to work with. And so, of course, when they wanted to write a classical piece, they just went out on the streets and, and were able to listen to flamenco music played by a guitarist. And so many of these composers were actually pianists. In the case of Valdenas, he was a piano player. So he, he would compose pieces on the piano based on what he was hearing a flamenco guitarist do. And then a little bit later on, say in the 1920s, Andre Segovia came along, who was a famous Spanish classical guitarist, and took those pieces from the piano and transposed them back to the guitar, <laughs> which is very interesting when you think about it. Segovia would never play flamenco in public. He was wanting to make the, the guitar a classical instrument. So, uh, although rumor has it, he could play fl a mean flamenco guitar <laughs> with, you know, with the uh, sufficient am amount of wine. But um, the, the interesting thing is, is that uh, this music, the Spanish classical music, has a lot of flamenco influence in it as well. So, fast forward, you know, to some of our collaborations. And so what I did was, was to take some of these pieces. Uh, in one case, uh, a Granados piece. Granados is actually from Barcelona and he has written some of the most beautifully melodic pieces I've heard. And not necessarily flamenco sounding, but what we did was is we, we had Satya do a little improv on some of the Granados. And then we went into the El Benes and uh, had her do some uh, syllabic things over that. So I just want to do a little bit of that because I think it's... Well, it's that'd be great. So we're hearing something that originates sort of in Spanish classical music and right. now gets, uh, which took its cue from the flamenco on the streets right. through several composers. And then now you're kind of uh, overlaying the Indian component on that. So sort of, sort of taking not? it back full <laughs> circle. Wonderful. Yeah, why not? <clears throat>
ಸರಿ ಸರಿ ಗಮ ಗಮ ಪಮ ಪಮ್ಮ ಗಮ ಪಮ ಪಗನಿತ ಗಮ ಪಮ ಪದನಿ ಸರಿ ದನಿ ನಿಧನಿ 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 ನಿಧವ breathtakingly beautiful thank you thank you so um do we have any other questions from the audience that was so lovely that kind of like sent you somewhere else that was, there was some duende there <laughs> there's always a few it just takes one to get it don't started be shy, don't, don't, be shy. Shy. don't be shy somebody okay there you go there you go Oh, good. That's a good question. Solea, solea versus buleria. Well, I put the, just, I'll, I'll let Patty answer that, but I did put, uh, if you notice, I have the basic compost cycle on the sheet, and I basically have the same for all three of them. So there is some similarity between all of them, and Patty can get into the, the, the differences. So tell us, a, and if, 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 it, if it helps to explain, also give us a little sample. Just sure. Um, buleria is the form that is in the Cante Chico, the party forms, you know? And it's faster. Um, and uh, so and it's, it, it's a 12 count rhythm um, and the accents shift. They can go from you know, accents. Uh, that, that's what kind of is difficult and complex about flamenco and the rhythms is the shifting of accents and feels. You know, it could feel like it can go, it can go into a six count feel and it could feel like a three count and then knowing where that falls within a 12 count cycle, it's kind of fun. Um, for some, might go crazy. But that's buleria, so for example... Um tengo pena porque tengo la cortina de mi algoda Son de teciotelo, ay celo That's buleria. That's like that's where you would get up and you know do your little your you know your little 15 seconds of fame. You would you know dance a little bit, and the solea is what we're gonna do um, at the very end, and it's it comes from the cante hondo, which is deep song. So there's a lot of um, melodic similarities in terms of the the modes, but it's it's a slower uh, form, and it's very it, it kind of touches on themes of of sadness. You know, solea comes from soledad which means um, loneliness. So, you know, uh, loss, grief, you know, um, death, you know, all these very sad and somber um, uh, things that they touch on in Solea, which they, is the mother, they say the mother of flamenco. But those, those particular accent patterns that I have on the page are valid for all three, Solea, Solea, Pro Buleria, and Buleria. So it, but it, what Patty is saying is the accents can shift, but a lot of times in, in most academic places, you'll see the 12 count written out like that with the accents on the 12, the 3, the 6, the 8, and the 10. So that's what they have in common. At their, their foundation, they're very similar. But in tempo and in shifting accents, they're different. And in Ida too, I would say, right? So totally. Any other questions? Any other questions? That was a really good one. Yes? Yes, I was born here.
Oh, but he, he hadn't met Pati. He hadn't met Pati. <laughs> or he would have a different opinion. Le Well, it, 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 I think, you know, we all get sometimes a little turfy about yeah. what, yeah. But, yeah. but I think it happens in, in every genre. And I think there's always uh, major surprises. We find out that, uh, like uh, both Satya and Patti were saying, you know, duende is duende, and duende, duende happens, you know, when, when the spirit and the soul of the music are there. I'd like to say one thing about that, though, because I think it is one thing that all of us, um, well, you guys... You know, you're coming from the mother country of your music, but Patty and I being born here, um, you know, it is something you think about, and you're like, should I go down this road, and how far down this road should I go? And all I can tell you is, as Americans, we are fortunate in other ways. Um, yeah, I, there, there are five-year-olds in Spain who can play these forms better than I can, but, but you know, I've, I've had the fortune to, to grow up in a great city for blues and jazz, and, um, you know, I've been able and I've been fortunate enough to travel to so many different places. I've lived with a Muslim family in Africa and played music with musicians there. I've, I've been to, to India. I've been to all these places. And so I've got something else to bring to the table. It might not be the perfection on a particular Palo, but it is something that I think is valid. And I think Patty has that too. And so we can only bring the gifts that we have. And so I think... Um, yeah, you're going to get those comparisons when you're talking about traditional flamenco. Is it the real deal? I mean, you know, I don't know how many performances I've been to where I've had people come up and I've played the Granados or the Asturias or I've played flamenco and somebody's like, you must be from Spain. You have to be from Spain. And I'm like, well, no, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> and, and, you know, but, but so, you know, really everybody has these images of their mind. If the flamenco dancer isn't wearing polka dots or she's not playing the castanets, I mean, everybody has like these things. And so it's like anything else, like Catalina says, in any genre, there are stereotypes. And then you get beyond the stereotypes by coming to a lecture like this, to be honest with you, because you get to find out exactly what we're all thinking and, and, and what the, what's behind all this music, you know. And it's not just about a woman in a polka dot dress dancing a Sevillana at, a, you know, at Cafe Barbariba. And not to say there's anything wrong with that, but you know what I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know well, what I'm saying? I'll, I'll I add think to that one thing that the, what I mentioned before about the first time, the first lesson I ever had, Guru uh, Cueto, you know, and I was asking him, can I do those things? And my voice can't go, oh, I can't do that, you know? And he said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And he said, you know, your voice, you are the master of your voice. You can have your voice do whatever you want. The thing with flamenco, he, was, he said to me, you know, it's ugly. You're not going to look pretty singing flamenco. He goes, forget <laughs> about that. He goes, you have to, you know, you have to let it out. Just like, and he made a comparison to blues in Chicago. He was those blues singers, he was when they sing, he was they go there. You know, and that's what you have to bring. He goes, you know, your problem is to do this mucha pena, you know, and I'm like, it's true, I'm I'm scared, you know. Because it's true, it's